Somebody said something to him about uh, him being wherever he was at, and he said, when you get my age, it's good to be anywhere. That's right. Amen. <laughs> so, that's the kind of way I feel tonight. I'm not in my 80s, but uh, sometimes my body believes it's in that in that age bracket. But I appreciate the opportunity to come be with you here at Sand Hill. have been praying and asking God to help us and prepare our hearts for what he wants to do in us. Our teenagers set the stage for the message tonight. I didn't know what Brother Austin, but I want to say thank y'all for coming tonight. Not just the teenagers, but some more of the folks. One of my son-in-laws, amen, my, my middle girl, and then my lovely wife. Stand up, Miss Sanders, so everybody will know who you are. Amen. That's, that's, uh, you were sitting with a preacher. I hope they amen. think that's your wife. That's, uh, well, she could pass from one of her children. Amen. That ought to give me some brownie points, shouldn't it? <laughs> 40, 49 years we've had the privilege to, to be together and uh, been trying to serve the Lord in full time service for, I think, 43 of those 49 years. And uh, it's, been, it's been a joy thankful for God's call on my life. I'm thankful for the opportunity again to stand where I stand tonight. I do not take it lightly. I know Brother John had many folks he could have prayed about and asked the Lord about, and uh, I'm honored that God let me come and be with you folks tonight. I want to help you this week. Amen. That's my heart's desire. I, 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 I hadn't come to, to try to hurt you. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you the word of God. I'm gonna do that. Amen. And if the word of God beats you up, best thing to do is just repent and get right. Amen. Amen. Uh, when we're right with God, brother Curtis, it don't hurt near as bad, does it? And, uh, <laughs> and our near as long. Uh, but when we resist it, but uh, but Austin, uh, it's the song, the second song he sang tonight, is going to fit very well. With where we're going tonight, Luke chapter number 14, Luke chapter number 14, uh, had this thought on my mind several weeks now to start this meeting, it may seem a little bit strange, I realize, I realize tonight as a, as a church that we, we desire that folks get saved. I believe one of the most urgent needs in our country today is for the church to get where it needs to be. I believe the subject we're going to deal with tonight is uh, is, is probably going is probably going to 
probably going to touch our hearts sharply tonight. Uh, at least I, I know it has mine as I've, I've prayed over it and studied over it and prepared and looked at it uh, that God certainly spoke to me very sharply about the, the subject we're going to be looking at tonight. Again, thank you for being here. Whoever fixed that great meal tonight, thank you. It was wonderful. Uh, I, I eat way too much, but I, I didn't want you to have to take a whole lot home. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am a priest of that. You stand to your feet, Luke 14, we're going to begin reading in verse 25, read down through the balance of the chapter tonight. Amen, and, preacher, uh, come on. Let God speak to our hearts and help us tonight. Great subject, ties in wonderfully with the last song that those teenagers sang. By the way, that's not all of them. If we'd have had all of them here, we'd have had this old choir law full, but I am thankful for those that come tonight. And uh, I'm going to try to get them headed back home. I know they got some of them got to school tomorrow. Again, verse 25, the Word of God says, And there went a great multitude, multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, hate not his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren and sisters, yea, and his long life also, he cannot be my disciple. Mm. Let that let that let that verse sink in for just a moment. Jesus concludes that verse with this statement: "Unless you're willing to do this, you cannot be my disciple." That's right. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he makes that statement again, cannot be my disciple. Then he gives an illustration here to try to help us understand what he's talking about. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. I'm going to put my finger right there for a minute and just give you a little food for thought. I wonder how many people in the world look at, 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 at Christianity today and mock us. Mm. That's right, preacher. Because of the fact that they know there's more to this thing than what we're displaying. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There's more to it than what we're displaying. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, here's our phrase again, he cannot be my disciple. Hmm. Salt is good, but if salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ear to hear, let him hear. Brother Austin, pray for us, would you? Father, we come before you today. We thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given us today. Yes. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you've brought us to this place to hear your word preached. Father, I pray now that you take the man of God, Lord. I pray that you'd hide him behind the cross. Father, I pray that you'd fill him with the Holy Spirit of God that he might preach the word 
that you'd have us to hear tonight. Father, I pray, uh, Lord, that you'd help us as a congregation to listen, Father, and to take those words that, Lord, you're preaching through your man, Lord, to, to take those words and that we might apply it to our lives, that, Father, we might we might go out and live a life that's pleasing unto you. Yes. Father, we sure do thank you once again for giving us this day. Father, we're thankful for uh, sending your Son to die mm. on the cross of Calvary, Father, that yes, we might live this God. day in victory over sin, over death, over hell. Father, I'm thankful for that. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. I want to reiterate the fact that if you come expecting to hear a profound preacher tonight, you're going to be disappointed. Very simple, very basic, very straightforward. This passage of Scripture that we've read tonight, I want to make something clear. Jesus is not talking about salvation here. Right. That's already settled. The group that He's talking to tonight are those who have a desire to move beyond the basics of salvation to, a, to an area of, of the Christian life. And, and in, our, in our text, Jesus uses this word disciple. Many, many different definitions that can be applied to that word disciple, but I, I jotted out some other words that maybe you and I can, can understand, not understand better, but maybe help us get a better understanding. What Jesus is challenging here is concerning our commitment to follow Him. Right. Our consecration to Him. Our, if you will, our dedication to Him. I, I, you look at people today and, and we live in a society where there seems to be very little of that in, in very many aspects of life. Right. Uh, people change careers. They change jobs. They uh, eat Batman, and again, I, I, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly, but a lot of folks, you know, they they change churches almost like they change clothes. Just there, there seems to be no commitment in them. And, and Jesus here is giving some requirements for you and I tonight, and have trusted Him as our Savior. That He says, "Listen, there's some things you need to understand." And, and I want to remind us of this tonight. Our salvation cost us nothing. Right. It is absolutely a free gift. Amen. But tonight, if, if we want to make a difference in the world, I'm glad Jesus chose out some men, poured His life into them, amen, and, and, and they were willing, Brother John, to make this commitment to be the disciples of Jesus. And I'll tell you something, they made a difference in their world. Right. Our world needs some people tonight yeah, that right. are more than just basic, fundamental Christians. We need some disciples of right. Christ right. in our churches tonight. We, we need some people that's willing to get beyond. And, and, and listen, we should never get over the excitement of being saved. I, Amen. I tell folks I hadn't got over it and don't have any desire to get over it. I enjoy it. Amen. Amen. Salvation so good, it's kind of like nanner pudding. Amen. You just want to keep going back and getting some more, but it don't work that way. But it's exciting. But Jesus is trying to challenge us here tonight. May I say to Ten Mile and to Sand Hill and any other churches that may be represented here tonight, our world needs some disciples tonight. Right. Amen. This community. That, that God placed this church in needs some folks tonight that when folks see them walking down the road, they're not, they're not just going to identify them as, as, as members at Sand Hill Baptist Church, but they're going to identify them the fact that they have taken that next step, if you will. They have made a commitment. They are consecrated. They are disciplined. They are, they are dedicated in their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. I'm thankful tonight that salvation is a free gift for who in, who in the world. I, I, I promise you tonight, if, if there was a price that would be put on it, if, if it was very much, most of us sitting in here tonight probably wouldn't be able to, to afford salvation. Right. And hey, what kind of price can you put on salvation? <laughs> I mean, all the money in the world. Uh, salvation's worth more than all the money in the world, but God said, listen. I got a free gift I want to offer you. Isn't it good? Isn't it good that God makes salvation free? Amen. I'm thankful for that tonight. 
But He lays out for us in this passage of Scripture. He tries, He's trying to challenge those that, that those multitudes that are following Him. Now in that multitude, there were some that were saved. There were some that believed on Him. There were some unbelievers there. But what He was trying to do was challenge this crowd. And these multitudes that was following Him that if you want to make a difference in your world, then you must become a disciple of Jesus. You've got to get beyond the basics of salvation. Right. You've got to get beyond the basics of just going to church. You've got to, you've got to understand there's some, there's some cost involved in being a disciple of Amen. Jesus Christ. Thank God salvation is free. <clears throat> I jotted this thought down, Brother John, and you may take issue with it if you do, not Brother John, but any of you. But I... I, I, I I jotted it down because the Lord laid it on my heart as I as I, as I meditated on this passage of Scripture. And I, I do understand that Jesus was interested in, in getting as many people saved as, 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 as humanly possible. But I jotted this statement down and in this context of this Scripture, I, I'm not sure Jesus was as interested in how many would follow Him as how far Amen. They would follow him. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, it, it's it's wonderful for folks to follow the Lord, but the question that Jesus is posing here is how far are you willing to follow me? That's right. How far are you willing to go with me? How what are you willing to to, to give up not for your salvation, but thank God because of your salvation? What are you willing to sacrifice? For me, I, there's three areas that I want to touch on tonight in this. And in this first verse, verse number 26, Jesus presents to us, if you will, a crisis of affection. He brings his, this multitude to the place to where he makes this statement. If you want to sum up what he's saying, in verse number 26, if you want to be my disciple, then there can be no rivals. That's right. That's right. There can't anybody else be in competition. There can't anybody else take my place. Mm. Boy, he lays it out pretty strong, does he not? Yes. I mean, if you all take issue with this tonight, you've got to take it with Jesus because Jesus wrote it. That's right. Amen. He's the one that said it. And if any man come to me, now again, he's not here. He's not dealing with the issue of salvation. He's dealing with the issue of discipleship. He's dealing with the issue of consecration. He's dealing with the, with the issue of how far are you willing to go with me? How far? Hate not his father. And mother, sorry, wifey, and wife, and children. Got one of my children here tonight. Sorry, daughter. And brethren, and sisters, and yea, his own life. Sorry, self. That's right. Jesus lays down, and Brother John, begins to lay a foundation for those that want to make a difference in their world. Jesus said, This is what it's going to cost you. There can be no rivals. That's right. There's a crisis of affection. One of the ways that I know for sure that this passage of Scripture. Is not dealing with salvation. It's because we know this tonight that God salvation places us in a in a realm where we know how to love. Amen. I didn't learn how to love until I got saved. That's right. Amen. Neither will you. Uh, you you may you may manifest some some lust and 
some of that, some of that uh, fleshly stuff, but until you get saved by the grace of God, you really don't know how to love. Right. And so I know that Jesus is, He's not telling us we're to run around hating everybody, but what He's saying is, is you can have no rivals when it comes to me. That's right. There can be nobody that's more important Again, the question is raised, Brother Austin, if, 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 if Jesus says that, that, that we're to hate our father and our mother and our wife and our children and our brother and our sister and even our own self, how in the world does that fit with a Scripture that teaches us we're to love and honor our father and mother? First commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother. Mm -hmm. how, how do we make that fit together? Well, it's not difficult when you, when you stop and think about what Jesus is trying to get us to see here, He doesn't listen tonight. The Lord does not instruct us to hate anyone. That's right. But He does say, when it comes to how much you love me, it's got to be so great that it makes your love for everyone else look like hate. You want to be my disciple? I'm not taking second row. I'm not playing. I think in the band, we got some former band members here. I think they called them first chair, second chair, third chair, fourth chair. I'd have been in the. I, they wouldn't even have had a chair for me. I can't play the radio without getting static. Amen. I'm not musically. Uh, blessed and talented. I got kids and grandkids that are, and thank God for it, but I'm not in that category. But may I, may I say to you tonight, the Lord says, listen, there's something you need to understand tonight. If you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to love me so much more than anyone else, including yourself. That that you have for yourself is going to look like hate. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what a difference that would make in our world if we love the Lord that much? It would make a tremendous difference in our lives. Our lives, our own personal lives. If we love the Lord that much. Now let's, let's be honest tonight. Let's be honest tonight. It, it, most most of the time, our our affection and our love is it, 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 it appears to be greater for the very ones that he said no 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 you got they've got to come second I've got to come first now, he didn't say we couldn't be saved but he said you can't be my disciple yeah. you know what Ten Mile Baptist Church needs tonight. Need some disciples. You listening to me, young people? Those of you from 10 miles, Sand Hill, you know what Sand Hill needs tonight? Sand Hill needs some disciples of the Lord. Just a few that love Him so much that it makes the love that they have for everybody else. When you, when you compare them one to the other, the love for God's way up here. The love for Jesus is way up here. And the love for everybody else, man, it's, 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 it's real insignificant. That's right. You know, it's an amazing thing when we love God like we're supposed to. Those that are way down here are going to know that we love them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Amen. They, 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 listen, they're going to understand that, that the Lord laid down the requirement, if you will, that listen, there can be no, there can be no crisis of affection. We, we, we struggle with that crisis of affection. We, 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 we have difficulty making sure that there are no rivals for our love for God. Now, the Lord lists a group of people here. But there's also some things that we could throw in there. Well, John probably thinks you get in deep trouble. Come on, preach. But I'm going to get in trouble anyway. I live in trouble most of the time. I would venture to say, sitting in this church tonight, there might be a deer hunter or two. Now, I haven't talked very much to any one of these men. 
I'm not against deer hunting. I love to eat deer. I'm not a deer hunter myself. I found my deer. Amen. I married my deer. Amen. And my deer cooks for me. Amen. And she cleans my clothes for me. Amen. Uh, I, I've got my deer. I don't. I don't need one of them horns. Amen. I'm not against you deer hunting. But I've seen it. Sometimes deer hunting creates a crisis of affection. Mm -hmm. I do enjoy fishing. Don't do much of it. There's a lot of different things that I enjoy, but I've got to be careful, Brother John, that it doesn't create a crisis of affection. That's right. That it doesn't take place. I, I, I'll be honest with you, and, and I'm not just picking on deer hunters. There, I mean, listen, there, there's all kinds of different hunters, but but there there's there's some there's some guys that get so wrapped up in in their hunting activities that that, that if I was their wife, they'd come home one day, uh, or maybe they wouldn't come home. <laughs> uh, maybe they got home the key wouldn't work that's right amen uh, and that's fine I realize there's some ladies we got a lady in our church she can make a deer hunter any men we got she loves deer hunting that's fine and I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with folks fishing amen golf and whatever it might be but the Lord says I, I want you to understand something if you're going to make a difference in, in your world, if you're going to make a difference in your world, then there can be no competition That's right. when it comes to how much you love me. How much you love me has got to be so much more than it is for everything or anything else that when folks look at it, it's actually going to look like that they are hated. Now talk about salvation. We're talking about discipleship. I've been around long enough that I, I, I can I can remember and call to my memory, Brother John, a few people that I believe met the qualifications, particularly in this area, that it would have been safe to call them a disciple. Because in their life, it was very evident that Jesus number one. It wasn't necessarily an outward show. You understand what I'm saying? They didn't wear a sign around it. They didn't wear a t-shirt that said, Jesus is number one in my life. No, no. They didn't have to do that because their life manifested. That's right. And the spirit that they displayed and the attitude that they had and, and, and their, 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 their desire and, and, and how it affected their life and the sweetness of their spirit and, 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 the, and the very fact that when you were in their presence, there was something special about it. I'm going to give you three little thoughts concerning this no crisis of affection as we look at the different stages to where people are in this area that Jesus is dealing with tonight. Most saved people just have Christ present in their lives. That's, that's the basics of salvation. When you get saved in the person of the Holy Spirit, Jesus moves inside of you. God moves inside of you. And most people tonight, that's where they're at. They, they know nothing of a, of a, of a Spirit-filled, victorious life. Ten mile people, young people, look at me tonight. There's more to this thing than just being saved. You hear me? I know Brother Austin preaches that to y'all all the time. You young men hear me tonight? There's more to this thing than just being saved. Brother Curtis, even being a preacher, there's more to this thing than just being saved and being called to preach the gospel. There's more to it than that. 
Most folks tonight live their life just saved. I like to say it this way. I'm glad salvation gets us a get out of hell free card. I ain't going to hell tonight, amen? Thank God for it because Jesus purchased for me a get out of hell free card. Then you got some saved people who made Christ somewhat prominent in their life. They've given Him a portion of their life. Now, my, my speculation would be there's probably some folks in this building that would very easily fit into this category tonight. That we've given Him some part of our lives. We live clean. We're, we're faithful to Somewhat faithful to church. It takes something pretty significant for us to to miss church. I, I want to brag on a lady, and I don't know nothing about her, but she had she had knee surgery, had knee replacement surgery a couple of weeks ago. Here she is in here tonight. I say hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. I hope folks that stayed out of church six months. That's right. For a knee replacement. But I ain't sure I seen her husband had it. He got a big old stick here. That might be the reason she's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's up in self defense. <laughs> somewhat committed, somewhat consecrated, somewhat faithful to the things of God. I, I, I'm afraid tonight, Brother Charles, that's. That's where we find way too many saved folks tonight. They're somewhat right. consecrated. That's right. But then there's that third group. And that third group is those who have made Christ preeminent in their life. By the way, the New Testament in the epistles teach us that Christ desires to have preeminence in our life. That, that big word simply means this. First place. Right. First place. And when He is first place, there's no crisis of affection. When He's first place, there's nobody that's competing against Him. There's right. nothing competing against Him. And, and so as we see those, those three, he, He's got first place. He, he's first in our passion. Again, I'm going to pick on the deer hunters. Listen, I, they're, they're, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Don't you think I do? I'm using it as an illustration. But man, some folks are passionate about that deer hunting. Yeah. They're so passionate. It can be 40 below zero. They'll get up three hours before daylight, go sit in the woods free, sit there and shiver and shake until the sun comes up hoping a deer is going to happen to come by. That's passion, you hear me? What did you look at your daddy for, Josie? I said, that's great. I love it. Well, I, I don't know too much, but that man sitting next to you that you married... Don't look for him to do that. <laughs> I tell you now, that ain't happening. <laughs> Passion. This this third one that 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 has that has grasped this cause to discipleship. He he not only has a great passion, but he's in constant pursuit of God. Amen. This one's greatest desire is to follow the Lord. <coughs> Please Him. The best example that I know of tonight to look at in Scripture to give us a picture of what a disciple looks like is Christ Himself. Amen. That's right. Because He was constantly in pursuit of Himself. He was God manifested in the flesh. Right. 
but he was constantly in pursuit, Brother Curtis, of pleasing his father. That's right. Every, every decision that he made was based upon his pursuit of pleasing his father. That's what disciples look like. Listen, I understand that. Some of you may be saying, Preacher, you're preaching something that's absolutely impossible. If it is impossible, why did God instruct us? Right. Why did God put right. it in the Bible? Why did He say there can be no crisis of affection? I've got. If you want to be my disciple, if you want to make a difference in the world, if you want to have the opportunity for your kids and your grandkids and your neighborhood and your community and your country to stand up for God, we've got to have some disciples. That's right. Amen. Not just saved folks. Amen. You've got to be some disciples. Close this part of this tonight with asking this question. How many do we know like that tonight? That's right. When you leave here tonight, go home and look in the mirror and say, Am I a mere saved person? Thank God I'm saved. Amen. But where am I at in this journey? Of being a disciple. Mm. Where am I at? Amen. Yeah, I, I promise you, if we'll ask the Lord, you know what He'll do? <laughs> He'll show us. That's right. He'll tell us. He'll tell us. I, what was the song? I want my life to count for Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, that might be, that might sum up the whole message, Brother John. That discipleship has. That idea that that we want our life to count for Jesus. That's right. Let me move to number two tonight. To be a disciple not only means no rivals, but it also means no refusal. Look at verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, Cannot be my disciple. Now listen, there's a lot of different areas and preachers much more intelligent than I am can carry you a lot of a lot of different directions when it talks about this verse and whosoever does not bear his cross. Now some believe that this may be a literal cross, walking around with it. I, I don't believe that's what he has in mind there. I know we've had we've had people who who have carried crosses from one side of America to the other and stopped in places and witnessed to people. God bless them. I, I don't I don't have an issue with that, but I don't believe Jesus is talking about there picking up a literal cross. Sure. Others others think that this this deals with some type of sickness or suffering. That 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 they are that they are, if you will, forced to live with. I, I don't believe he's talking about that there. Even though some do have great physical difficulty in their life. The general sense tonight, I do not believe that the cross is something that is forced upon us, but I want you to notice. That Jesus, I believe the, 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 the mindset He's trying to get us to see here in order to be this disciple is, is, is something that this cross is something that we willingly bear. Did He willingly bear His? Yeah. Did somebody hold a gun to His head? No. He willingly bore His cross. He left heaven. <laughs> He left heaven to come and bear that cross. He left heaven knowing that that cross was His final destiny. Right. And He willingly. Did He not say, no man takes my life from me? I That's right. lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. Sure. If we're going to be His disciples, He says in verse 27, then you've got, you've got to take up that cross willingly, 
take up that cross. Now, let me give you some thoughts about that tonight. This cross that, that Jesus bore, may I say to you, was a the cross that He bore was a, was a testament, if you will, to His submission to His Father's will. So maybe tonight what He's trying to get us to see in this thought is that there's got to be a submission of our will to His will if we want to be His disciple. Right. It's not an area that, that God says, look, we, we, can, we can come to some kind of collective bargaining agreement on it. He says, no. There's got to be a willingness to submit your will to my will. But again, he was not forced to carry his own cross. But the Bible says that he steadfastly set his faith to Jerusalem, knowing that the cross awaited him there. The cross of Christ is not only a testament to his submission to his Father. But the cross of Christ is also a testament to the shame of the world. That's right. That cross is a testament to the utter hatred that the world had for Christ. Mm -hmm. hey, by the way, that's still very much present in our world. Today. You're right. It's a lot more prevalent in the, in the great country of the United States of America, Brother John, than I ever thought I'd see it be in my lifetime. Right. Can you believe the hatred that people have for God today? Right. The disdain, the disrespect. I never thought in my lifetime that I would ever see it to the degree. But may I say to you, that is to their utter shame. Amen. We're going to be a disciple, we've got to be willing to bear the cross of the submission of our will. And we've got to be willing to undergo the hatred of the world. That's right. And not hate them in return, but rather do what? Love, Love them in return. See, that bearing of that cross is... It's where we submit our will to Him. I'm going to tell you something now. We'll, we'll not effectively and we'll not, we'll not with, with any success tonight convince the world that we are the disciples of Jesus until we take up that cross and submit our will to His. And then will, that, will, that, will God work in our lives and those that hate us that they can see that we do not hate them, but rather that we have great love and compassion for them. For we understand that they're still in darkness. Remember when you were in darkness? Right. Remember, remember when God translated you from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God? Took you out of that kingdom of darkness, placed you in the kingdom of light? Hey, man, remember how wonderful it was when you passed from the, from the, from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. What a, what a difference it made in your life. I've got to hurry up and get through. We've got to get these kids back home. To follow Christ. But John, we've got to be willing to invite that same rejection and hatred upon ourselves. Mm. Mm. The cross is also a testament to the complete surrender of our rights. That's right. Isn't it amazing all the people that holler for their rights today? Mm -hmm. Little people, big people, narrow people, wide people, short people, pretty people, ugly people. What are you laughing about, son? You look at me and laugh. Dad, you're right, preacher. You are ugly. <laughs> this young man just got saved what Sunday Sunday week no, this, Sunday. this Sunday this young man sitting here in this purple shirt what's his name amen another blessing brought his friend he come to revival not brought his friend with him just got saved amen amen We must surrender. 
to his will for our life. That's right. When we surrender his will for our life, our pride becomes crushed. Show me a prideful person, and I'll show you somebody that their will is not surrendered. That's right. To surrender will crushes pride. The will is broken. Dear preacher friend of mine often makes this statement, it's time for us to get down off the throne of our life and enthrone Christ. That's right. Amen. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves tonight. Most of the time, we are the king of our life. <laughs> You're right, preach. We're going to be a disciple. we got to surrender the throne of our life to Him. Right. we got to, we got to get off the throne and enthrone Him in our life. Mm. And say, Lord, I'm no longer the king of my life. I want You to be the king of my life. I, I'm not talking about your salvation now. I'm talking about being a disciple. You're right, preacher. But boy, that sure is expensive, preacher. It sure is. Yes. But if we want to make a difference in our world, we want to make a difference in our world. I, I, I've read of a lot of the great preachers and evangelists and, and, and people of yesteryear, uh, and, and one of the things, Brother Bishop, that stands out in my mind as I've read their stories is that those folks surrendered the kingship of their life to Him. Go study Hebrews chapter 11. Mm -hmm. right. You won't find any of those recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. Those were disciples. Yes. Yeah. They, they got down off the throne of their life and they said, you're the king. Amen. Let me give you the third one. We'll be free. To be a disciple... means no retreat. Look at verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. That's right. No retreat. The Lord gives us in this passage two illustrations. Number one, the importance of counting the cost. Someone asked William Booth's children the secret of their father's success. One of the children replied, one day General Booth gave everything that was of Booth to the Lord. Hmm. The daughter said this, the key was not that he gave everything to the Lord. The key was he never did take any of it back. <laughs> That's right. Hello? How many, how many times tonight have you and I made a journey down to the altar in the church? We gave it to the Lord. I'm afraid far too many times it didn't stay there. That's right. Sometime before we got back out the door, we took it back there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be a week or two. Sometimes it might even be months. But I believe the daughter had it right. It was not the fact that he gave it all to the Lord. It was the fact that he gave it and never picked it up again. Right. It never became his again. It was given to the Lord. Thank God salvation is free. Yes. But discipleship is costly. Yep. Now I want you to understand something that I'm not standing here preaching that the Lord telling you to go home and not put your house up for sale. To get rid of your car, to empty your bank account. To follow him. That's not what he's saying. He's not even telling you to sit down tonight and write a letter to your husband or your wife or your children or your mom and dad and say, I hate to give you this bad news, but I hate you. That's not what he's saying. That's right. Not at all. 
But he is saying this. If you're going to be my disciple, you're going to love me so much that everyone and everything else is going to be way down to the list. I'll have no rivals. I won't accept it. You can't be my disciple if you've got somebody competing for your affection. <clears throat> No rivals. No rivals. I got to be willing to give up, Brother John, tonight. Whatever God puts his finger on in my life. That's right. See, one thing we need to understand tonight, and I think you do understand this, is the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. Right? Yeah. And tonight he knows where to put his finger. What it is that's keeping us from being the disciple that we need to be. And he'll put his finger on it if we'll ask him to. He'll point it out to us. And then it's up to us what we're going to do about it. Right? It's up to us. He said that we must be willing to go anywhere He calls us to go. We must be willing to say that because we love Him more than we love anyone or anyone else, anything else, Lord, if that's what You want, if that's Your will for my life, then I surrender. Get about my scrolls. We looked at three very simple little thoughts tonight concerning this area of discipleship. Of being his disciple. Three times he said, if you're not willing to do this, you cannot be my disciple. crisis of affection. Crisis of affliction. Take up your cross. <clears throat> and a crisis of allegiance. No writings. No refusal. No retreat. But Austin, if we get the young people back there for a But John, let me be okay. I'd like for these teenagers to come back tonight. <clears throat> but I want you to understand something tonight, teenagers. When you come up here to sing, if God spoke into your heart, when the thing will start to get there and do business to God. Sure. Doing what God wants you to do is more important than singing. Get them up here, Brother Austin. They're going to they do our invitation. I want you to go back and sing that song. I want my life to count for Jesus. And then those, the rest of us that are out here tonight, <clears throat> I'd ask you tonight, I'd ask you tonight, how are we doing in that area of the discipleship? How are we doing tonight? What's, what's competing? What's competing for our affection? What's competing tonight for our relationship with the Lord. What's competing tonight for our time? The Lord said, listen, you will be my disciple. Salvation is free. I've given it to you to give. But you won't be my disciple. It's going to cost us. You know what Sam Hill Baptist Church needs tonight? You know what this preacher y'all just called needs tonight? He needs some disciples of Jesus. This church needs some disciples. Some of you here from Ten Mile now, our church needs some disciples. We need some folks to step up and say, yeah, Lord, I realize there's a great cost to it. Very costly. But you know what, Lord? I'm saying that. Why? Because 
I love you. And I want my love for you to be so great that everything else fails in comparison. You ready, son? You want to stand to your feet? God spoke into your heart and you need to come tonight and do business with God. These, people, these young people are going to sing. I want my life to count. God spoke in your heart. You need to come. You come on. Thank you, Brother John.